This presentation is the fifth in a series of six different chemical classes of concern and focuses on organic solvents. Uh, it also includes some chemicals based on the halogens that were noted in the first three classes, uh, particularly chlorine, but also bromine and fluorine. So this webinar covers a very broad class of substances that are used as solvents. Uh, it'll focus on organic solvents, uh, which by the way has nothing to do with organic or pesticide-free agriculture, but refers to chemicals based on carbon. So what are solvents and what basic functions do they perform? Uh, we use them to dissolve or disperse, in which case you want solvents that other chemicals will dissolve in. Uh, we use them as carriers, where you want solvents that will help spread a material and will then volatilize easily, meaning they'll evaporate readily, leaving behind, for example, a film of solid paint. Uh, one way to clean dirt or grease or remove a coating is to use a solvent to dissolve it. Uh, and we also use solvents is, as a mixing medium, uh, for example, to facilitate a chemical reaction between other different chemicals. Uh, so we're going to look at some of the different subclasses of organic solvents. So I'm going to mention some different classes of organic solvents and some of the consumer products that they're used in. Uh, the first type here is hydrocarbon solvents. As they're typically petroleum-based, made of carbon and hydrogen. Again, they're organic chemicals, and they're typically made from petroleum, but sometimes also from other natural materials, for example, turpentine. Uh, the first type is aliphatic, so that would be a straight chain of carbon. You see here the chemical structure for hexane. Uh, other types, of things like petroleum distillates, mineral spirits, uh, you might find those used as carrier solvents in paints and coatings or as thinners to dissolve wet paint off a brush. Uh, they also dissolve grease, and they're used in heavy-duty degreasers like for auto repair. Second type is aromatic. Uh, they would be based on a benzene ring. You see here the uh, chemical structure for toluene. Uh, they might be used in things like adhesives and printing inks. So you heard in earlier webinars about halogens and the many useful functional properties that they can produce as well as the health hazards. Uh, here uh, we can see how chlorine can be added to a hydrocarbon solvent to make them less flammable and uh, still have many useful properties. Uh, one example of a chlorinated solvent is methylene chloride or dichloromethane. It's used as very effectively as a paint stripper. Uh, perchloroethylene or perk uh, is used in dry cleaning as a solvent very widely used. You can also use other halogens like bromine or fluorine to make other halogenated solvents. So there are many different types of solvents that add oxygen to that hydrocarbon to make what we we'll call oxygenated solvents. Uh, examples are acetates or acetone. Uh, acetates are used widely in nail polish. Um, acetone is used as a nail polish remover. Uh, glycol ethers used in janitorial cleaners, um, alcohols used also in cleaners and in personal care products. So there's a, a wide variety. This is just a few examples of oxygenated solvents. Uh, another class is a chain or ring of silicon and oxygen uh, with hydrocarbon groups attached to that. They're called organosilicons or siloxanes. Uh, two examples shown here are uh, the cyclic kinds, uh, D4 and D5. D5 is used as a dry cleaning solvent under the brand name Green Earth. Um, and then D4 and D5 are both used in personal care products and uh, hair conditioners, cosmetics, etc. They have multiple functions in those products. They're uh, an emollient and a solvent, and they control viscosity. They have a very nice uh, silky, soft, uh, creamy feel to them, so they uh, add a lot to those products. Um, you might see them labeled on the ingredient list as uh, cyclomethicone or cycloseloxanes. Here, there's one shown with cyclopentasiloxane. So this last class should look familiar to you. It's not an organic solvent, but it is certainly nature's original solvent. Uh, water is a good solvent, although it's relatively slow to evaporate. Uh, it does dissolve some things very well, but it doesn't dissolve all materials. We often have to formulate a water-based product using other chemicals to help disperse things in the water. 
So what are the health concerns with organic solvents? Uh, here are listed some of the common human health concerns. This is a very broad, diverse category, so there are various concerns with various substances. Uh, most organic solvents will have issues of neurotoxicity, meaning they affect the central nervous system. They might cause headaches or dizziness. Uh, in extreme cases, they can cause you to lose consciousness. Uh, some of the chlorinated and brominated substances are carcinogens, meaning they are suspected or known to cause cancer. Uh, many of the organic solvents cause liver and kidney toxicity. Uh, some of the substances uh, cause reproductive toxicity, meaning they interfere with uh, a human or an organism's ability to reproduce. Uh, that's true of the ethylene glycol ethers uh, and N-methylperilidone, NMP. Um, some of them also cause contact dermatitis, meaning they pull the oils out of the skin. Um, so we have other concerns as well, and again, it's a diverse category, so the concerns are various, but in terms of environmental impacts, uh, most Organic solvents are volatile organic compounds, meaning they will evaporate into the air and contribute to ground-level ozone pollution, which causes smog. Um, some of them are hazardous air pollutants, meaning they're particularly toxic when they're released to air. Uh, there's a potential for groundwater contamination from spills. Uh, historically, many of these substances have been just dumped on the ground and have caused groundwater contamination. And some of them are persistent in the environment. For for example, siloxanes are persistent in sediments. Uh, the chlorinated solvents are persistent in groundwater and, again, have uh, frequently in the past, uh, because of bad practices, caused groundwater contamination. Um, there are safety concerns. Most of these substances, except for the halogenated solvents, are flammable, and some of them are quite flammable. Uh, for example, acetone has a flash point of zero, I think, less than zero degrees Fahrenheit, so a spark or a hot surface can ignite that vapor and cause an explosion or fire. So that's a brief summary of some of the hazards of organic solvents. So what about exposure? Uh, here are some examples of how we get exposed to solvents. Uh, first of all, in order to make them evaporate quickly, which is usually an important functional property, we want them to be volatile. We want them to readily evaporate. But that volatility also makes them available to be inhaled. So for example, methylene chloride is used in paint strippers. It's very volatile. And it also has a high vapor density, meaning when that it evaporates into a vapor, that vapor will sink down to the floor. So if you're working in a bathtub or you're working in a large tank and you put your head down in the bottom of the tank, then you will find a heavier, thicker vapor down there. And we have had a number of cases of worker deaths from bathtub refinishing because they put their head down in the bottom of the tub and weren't aware beforehand that that's where all the vapor was, and they become overcome. Uh, cyclosiloxanes are a slightly different situation. They are volatile, but much less so than many organic solvents. Um, but they are, again, used in many different personal care products as carriers, lubricants, solvents. Uh, and so they're ubiquitous. They're all around us in all environmental media. They're in sewage sludge. Uh, some of them persist in sediments in the environment. So they're what we refer to as pseudo-persistent meaning they don't stay in the environment that long, but people are exposed to them all the time. So it's the same effect as if they were persistent. So what are governments doing about these concerns? Uh, many solvents are very well regulated in terms of worker exposure limits, or VOC, the volatile organic compound limits, in consumer products, but many are not. Uh, typically, the newer the substance to the market, the less well regulated it is. For example, siloxanes uh, are not terribly well regulated. Um, and, and we have learned that there is no such place as a way Everything that we use in a personal care product that has a siloxane in it, that's going to go somewhere. It's either going to go to your wastewater treatment plant or, or evaporate into the air or somewhere. Uh, and they, while they degrade, they don't 
uh, was readily degrade. Uh, we still have some lingering concerns about the health and ecosystem effects. So at this point, governments are monitoring their presence in the environment. Uh, and in some cases, particularly for D4, they're taking action to try to reduce their discharge into the environment. But this is a case where they're uh, mostly being watched by governmental agencies trying to figure out just what the issues are and what they ought to do about it. So here at the Toxics Use Reduction Institute, we always ask, what's the solution? So what's the solution to the organic solvents of concern? Uh, in many cases, there are safer alternatives available. For paints and coatings, there are water-based products. Uh, for paint strippers, we gave the example of methylene chloride. There are others that are safer based on, for example, dibasic esters. Uh, in garment dry cleaning, which uses PERC or perchloroethylene, uh, we've found that you can use wet cleaning, meaning you don't need to use an organic solvent. You can use a small amount of water and detergents in special uh, equipment and use special tensioning equipment to finish your garment at the end and you get equivalent results. Uh, for things like ethylene-based glycol ethers, there are propylene-based glycol ethers which will work as well. Um, and these are just a few examples of where there are safer alternatives available. So the takeaway points for organic solvents, uh, there's a very diverse set of substances. There are many known health, environmental, and safety concerns with these chemicals. Uh, we gave you examples of some of those. Um, there are still some emerging concerns or questions, especially with newer uh, products and newer chemicals. Uh, for example, the cyclosiloxanes. Uh, there are safer alternatives available to many of them, and we should work hard at trying to uh, get those adopted. Um, and we need to move forward using green chemistry. So there are ways to develop new substances and new chemistries that are safer than the old ones, and and we need to be able to invest in that and move forward. So we were asked to conclude with a book recommendation. And uh, my recommendation is a book called Materials Matter by Dr. Ken Geyser. Uh, and I have a little quote from it here. The products we purchase and use are assembled from a wide range of naturally occurring and manufactured materials, but too often we create hazards for the ecosystem and human health as we mine, process, distribute, use, and dispose of these materials. This book argues that the safest and least costly point at which to avoid environmental damage is when the materials are first designed and selected for use. So thank you very much. Um, I'll take some questions. And if your question doesn't get answered, please feel free to contact me. If I can't answer it, I'll put you in touch with other staff here at Turi or other folks who should be able to answer it. Thank you very much.